Welcome to episode number nine of Medicine Basics. Today I talk about the evolutionary approach in medicine. Uh, in the last episode, I showed you that different information sources have different uh, quality, are of different quality. And I said that basic sciences are the best information source available to us. So what I look at today is evolutionary biology. So it's a basic science. Uh, my name is Davide Patti and I am a scientist and a researcher. So on the left side, again, the topics I will cover today in bold is what we are currently covering, uh, what I'm currently discussing. So let's start. Why does evolution matter? Uh, this especially when we have advanced scientific research, such as the biochemical research, most research nowadays is in biochemistry. Uh, the answer is simple. <clears throat> what we are today is a product of many years of evolution. Um, how can we ignore this? Um, if you want to understand how our body works. So the first forms of life, bacteria. Uh, these are prokaryotes, uh, are estimated to have appeared 3.5 billion years ago. So life started with, with a bacteria, with bacteria. These are single cell organisms, so it's just one cell. They do not have a cell nucleus. Um, then life evolved in the form of eukaryotes. So these are animal and plants, and these are multicellular. And approximately 5 million years ago, apes uh, started to develop human-like characteristics, or let's say we started to develop human-like characteristics, and, and we have been the Homo sapiens for the last 100,000 years. So this is why I'm writing 100,000, 5 million, 3.5 billions. Then I think, yeah, understanding what happened in the first or in the past 5 million years, or in the past 100,000 years, is important to understand what we are, or who we are today. So our species is called Homo sapiens. It's the man who knows, sapiens in Latin. Here are a few quick facts about us. Uh, let's say if we take into consideration mainly the last 100, 200,000 years. Uh, this is just to make sure that we understand, you understand who we really are and um, I get a sense of what, what is important. I am summarizing the most, most important facts, in my opinion. Yeah, all of these numbers here are, are approximated, just a heads up. And, I'm giving you a picture that you can remember. There is no advantage in giving you in trying to give you a picture that is in ultra high resolution. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so our being is made up of more microbes than cells. So you see here 33 trillion cells and 40 trillion microbes. Uh, that's the most recent number. Most statistics to date say we have 10 times more microbes than we have cells. Then our biology, our organ system in general is very close, very similar to that of our other mammals. Then we evolved from a microbe, as I said, we cannot forget that. We should not forget that. We, look like, we looked like apes for a long time and we started walking in the erect position uh, approximately 1 million years ago. Then we have been obligated movers. This means that we always had to move to survive and we are an opportunistic omnivore. This means we eat, we can, we are able to eat everything. Then we are social. We mostly lived in tribes and we are capable of adapting to different climates. These are very important points. Then our activities consist of what I've listed here, this is, remember, it's the last hundred of thousands of years so, or even millions. So mating, hunting, gathering, eating, resting, 
fighting, running, and culture. Culture just uh, just means it's the product of our work. That's uh, what we uh, what I what culture actually means. So building tools, any tool, or, or building shelter, for example. Then we are on top of the food chain. We are conscious and intellectual, especially compared to other species. Again, compared to other primates, this is more specific. We have a smaller digestive system and a larger brain. And just on a side note, uh, important uh, points, we are more than 70% water by weight and more than 50% legs by height. And to repeat, very crucial point, one very crucial point. So bacteria were on this planet way before any, any modern plant was. Uh, we evolved in symbiosis with them, or symbiosis, symbiosis, I say. Meaning they are part of us and take care of crucial aspects of our functioning. So, for example, they digest food. They regulate the immune response. We know, we know now they regulate <clears throat> our behavior and our choices as well. The choice of food, for example, or the choice of a, ma a mate, potential mate, this is regulated by bacteria. Yes, we now, or let's say we scientists have now accepted this fact and we are focusing heavily on the role of bacteria in regulating different bodily systems. I have listed here a few of them. So gut brain, gut skin, gut liver, axes are now uh, under heavy investigation. Next topic is genetics and, and epigenetic, epigenetics. So first of all, what are, what are genes? Uh, what is genetics? In very simple terms, genes contain a code, the DNA, uh, then a part of this DNA is expressed and produces uh, it's expressed in form of proteins. These proteins uh, are responsible for regulating reactions inside our body, so they re uh, regulate our metabolism. We can say genes are very important, of course. Uh, our DNA contains different, uh, the code for different proteins that might or, not, or might not be expressed at a certain point. As I said, only a part of this DNA is expressed. Yeah, today we also know that most of the DNA inside of us is DNA of microbes. So the microbial DNA is what we call microbiome. Yeah, so why is genetic and epigenetics important for us? It's important because uh, uh, it's important in a sense that certain genes are associated with different with, with certain diseases. It's important to understand that this doesn't mean that if you have this gene, you will also have the disease. It just means that you could or you're more susceptible to developing a disease if this gene if this code gets expressed. And very important now, today we understand that the environment inside and outside of us regulates this gene expression. So this is what we call epigenetics, and this is a still a very new science. And it's a science that somehow redimensioned the importance of, of, of uh, genetics. The next topic is the mitochondria. The mitochondria is an organelle inside of our cells, uh, as you can see in the illustration on, on top. There are many mitochondria in every cell, uh, depending on the type of tissue. Some tissue have more. Liver, brain, and heart, for example, have more. 
they are very important organs. So it makes sense that they have more of these organelles. So the role of these organelles is to produce the energy that is required for our reactions inside of our body. Uh, this energy is called, is in form of ATP. It's uh, our uh, energy currency inside of our body. See? Then by far the main theory is that the mitochondria itself was originally a bacteria that lived in symbiosis or symbiosis with eukaryotes. They also look very similar. Uh, what we observe in most chronic diseases is that mitochondrial health is reduced. This is why I'm including uh, mitochondria as a topic. So we can see, we see and we observe in many chronic diseases that mitochondrial health is reduced. So the energy output is reduced. They do not produce uh, as much energy as they are supposed to. Um, so yeah, mitochondrial health is a marker for overall health, can be used as a marker. Uh, it is a way to measure homeostasis level. <clears throat> also important here is that addressing the mitochondrial, dis mitochondrial dysfunction is always a therapeutic option, but also that uh, this dysfunction is probably not the underlying cause of most diseases. It's just what we observe. There is an as association, not a causation. Now the role of disease. So what is actually the role of disease from an evolutionary standpoint? Um, <clears throat> living beings in general evolve through changes or not in general, they evolve through changes, either a change in environment or an internal change, which is usually a mutation. So it is the combination of genetics and environment that will determine the strength and weaknesses after the change, of course. So <clears throat> in general, when we talk about mutations, most of them are detrimental and lead to the death of the specimen. When a uh, mutation in the gene occurs, most mutations lead to early death. Um, yes, so this is the process that we, uh, that got us from bacteria to what we are today, let's say. It's uh, the evolutionary, the, just evolution of the species driven by changes either in environment or in, uh, in, in the DNA. Then disease is clearly a mechanism in nature to weed out specimens that are weak. So it is a natural selection. Uh, this is just an observation. This is just what it is. So when you're diseased, you're weak and you are likely to die or more likely to die. <clears throat> now we know that in the last 100 years, genes didn't change. Genes change slowly. Um, I said that genetic mutation are also mostly deadly right away. Um, so yeah, on the other hand, the environment has changed considerably. What we can say is that it looks like the environment triggers disease promoting genes. So we have some, we have these genes already and that the environment somehow triggers or has trigger is triggering these genes at some point of the life of a third to a half of the population, as we saw um, in early lessons. Then as a conclusion, we can say that technically today we observe a natural selection that is weeding out all, all human all human beings that are incompatible with, with this new environment that we have. And again, as a consequence of this observation, therapeutic intervention would be to either change the DNA, our own DNA or bacterial or microbial DNA, or on the other side, uh, we can change the environment or we can address both. The needs and health. This is an ultra an ultra simple model I used in the 
in one of the first lessons, uh, every living being has evolutionary goals. These are essential for the survival of the species and are pre-programmed inside of each individual. Usually it's uh, to survive and to reproduce. Or it's always the ultimate goal is always to survive and reproduce. So to fulfill these needs, we we have some primal needs, um, which are the needs common, common to all mammals. And let's say, for example, food and water uh, to achieve this, uh, these primal needs. Mammals would uh, hunt and gather. And let's say we would work for money and buy food, buy, buy food and water. So working and buying would be personal needs that fulfill this primal need. So why is this important when it comes to health uh, and disease? So needs are important because they determine your environment. They determine our environment. They determine our action and so they determine our environment. And as we saw, environment determines our health and our disease. That's why needs are important in this concept. These are some details, uh, just to elaborate a little bit on uh, the past slide. What is important is that maybe the last point, health is a state of feelings on our body. This is our initial definition. And it's a state that allows us to meet our personal needs. And disease, on the other hand, is the inability to fully meet our personal needs. Now, a few observations at this point. Our needs determine our action and our environment. Again, it's a repetition. I also showed you how the env environment influences our health. Um, now, if health is the overlap between our capabilities and our needs, it means that technically we can increase health, increasing our either increasing our capabilities, but also if we reduce our needs. Uh, then, most important, uh, we understand that our needs and so our activities have changed considerably, while our primal needs are unchanged. This if we, is especially relevant if we look at the past one hundred years. Yeah, so what has changed in the past 100 years? I want to look at this in some more details. We said primal needs haven't changed, but personal needs have, so our activities have. And how did these changes reflect in our environment? So here are a few observations I think we can all agree on without going into uh, the literature. First of all, we have more exposure to the extra-natural. Extra nature is everything which is not originally present in nature. What do I mean? Um, we see wavelength. So we have more, uh, we have inter it just means we have introduced new ways to transfer energy through the air, such as we have light bulbs, we have halogen bulbs, LEDs, we have radio frequencies, we have Wi Fi, we have microwave, we have cell phones. These are all non native uh, frequencies. Um, then we have introduced hundreds of thousands new extra natural molecules, substances. Uh, we have them in the air, water, in the utensils we use, in the beds we sleep in, in the cars we drive, in the foods we eat, in, uh, and also mo most medicine we take. So these are mole molecules that our that nature doesn't know, that our body doesn't know. Then we have new foods. We have more foods from outside our environment. So uh, I'm from Switzerland. I can get a banana now from Costa Rica in, uh, in at Christmas, during Christmas. So it's very cold. Then we have more GMOs, uh, genetically mod modified organisms. Uh, we have more processed foods and new ways of processing foods as well. Then we have new stimulations. We have apps, uh, web apps, we have Facebook, um, we have YouTube, we have mobile phones, we have apps, we have more addiction. These are addictions basically in stimulations. That's what I mean. These are dopamine stimulating um, activities, yeah. 
then we have more chronic stressors. We have more bureaucracy. We have more laws, social complexity. We have more news. We have more connections. Then we have, we have less movement and less exposure to natural elements. This is due to the tertiarization of economics, office jobs, and how, uh, and also with internet, I, I think we have internet connection everywhere. So we move less and we are less exposed to nature. Then we have more intellectual jobs and we have more educated people. Then we have, uh, we have had, and we have uh, dietary trends. Now, these are all changes in our environment. This information will become uh, more practical in future lessons, but it's important to understand that our personal needs have changed. Our environment has changed as a consequence uh, uh, to the changes in personal needs. The last topic and a very important one, comfort and health, how are they related? Um, <clears throat> if you think about uh, if you think about it in nature, if you are a skilled animal, you will be thriving. Uh, if you are a better hunter, you will have abundance of food. Uh, you will also have more time to relax as a consequence and, and you will have more time to reproduce. You will be more comfortable, we can say. So you understand that in such a setting, comfort is always something we would seek. Uh, so you, we understand that abundance is originally associated with thriving and health. So comfort is associated with abundance and it's associated with thriving and health. Uh, we can think of comfort just as we think of sex. These are two things a healthy animal is hardwired to look for just because the, uh, of the evolutionary association. Now, the problem is that today comfort is capitalized upon to sell, is used to sell. So just like sex sells, comfort sells as well. Uh, clothing brand use sex to sell. Uh, movies sell sex to sell. They use sex to sell. Uh, in the same way, uh, most brands use comfort to sell. The problem is that sex and comfort are so taken out of their natural context. Uh, on the bottom here, you see I've listed some primal activities, so activities of our ancestors in yellow, pl plotted on a graph that shows our health promoting, or, or let's say this graph shows on one axis the health uh, promotion and also the comfort potential of this activity. So I recommend you spend some time looking at this graph. Uh, what we note is, what we can appreciate is that there's a correlation between he health and comfort. This is what I said before, there's the association. So the more health promoting activities are associated with more comfort potential. So our health, so there's a historical health and comfort synergy. Now, if we add today's activities in red, we realize that things have changed. Um, usually the more comfortable the activity, the product, the service, the more detrimental it will be to our health, as you can see here. So th this correlation has changed. It's, it's more a trade-off between health and comfort. This is a very important concept to keep in mind. Moving forward. Yeah, so this was it. I've covered a few very important truths about our nature. Uh, although this information is obvious to an evolutionary biologist, most of this information is not taught to physicians. Uh, we now appreciate the importance of our personal needs in shaping our environment and that this environment interacts with our genes and the genes of uh, the microbes inside of us uh, to promote health or disease. Now make sure you understood 
all the concepts uh, of this lesson. They are fundamentally understanding our bodies uh, to understand our health and the disease and also the approaches we need to shift our homeostasis back to health or to keep it at a healthy level. So I hope to see you in the next lesson and thank you for your attention.